Now it's time to hear the stories of Utes in their own words. This is Utes Insider presented by Pepsi. Here's your host, Mike Legaschult. Well, when I started this show a few months ago, part of the idea was to provide a diversion for people to provide an escape and allow them to relive some of the great moments in our athletics history, also to connect with some of our great athletes and coaches. But I also want this to be a show about people and specifically their personal struggles and their stories and to let our listeners know that, hey, you're not alone and to help enlighten them just a little bit. And this show is going to be one of those that leans heavily on the latter and much less on the former. Reverend France Davis, who recently retired as a pastor for Calvary Baptist Church after 46 years, has been far more than just a preacher presiding over a congregation. He has fought numerous battles on behalf of Utah's black community since the early 1970s. He's been an instructor at the U since 72. And he's worked with Utah's team since 2003, providing counsel and comfort to numerous athletes over that time. So part of our conversation will be about his time with the Utes. A large part will be about his thoughts on our current struggles for racial and social Social equality and also his ideas on how we can move things forward in a positive and productive manner. And as someone who is now in his 70s and marched with Dr. Martin Luther King during another time of civil unrest back in the late 1960s, I thought his perspective would be invaluable to all of us. So stay with us. Reverend France Davis, our guest on this edition of Utes Insider, presented by Pepsi in just a moment. To hear more episodes of this show and other Utah Athletics podcasts, search for them on iTunes, Spotify, and YouTube. Now, back to more of Utes Insider, presented by Pepsi. Welcome back, and please be joined by an activist and someone who has been seen as the conscience of our community in Salt Lake City for a long, long time, Reverend France Davis, who recently retired as the pastor for Calvary Baptist Church after 46 years of serving that congregation. He's also uh, now the Emeritus Adjunct Professor for communications and ethnic studies at the University of Utah, and he's still involved with the Utah Athletics Department as a chaplain for the U of U football team. And Reverend Davis, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Thank you. It's my pleasure to be a part. So happy to have you with us. You know, we'll get into uh, a lot of topics I want to have you touch on this afternoon, but before we do that, I want to get into your background just so uh, people who maybe aren't familiar with you, they, they get a little bit more background before we dive into things here a little bit to, to set it up. But you've lived in Salt Lake City since the early 1970s, and I understand you came here with the idea of teaching at the U for really a year, and then you were going to move on to other things, and you had just received your degree in rhetoric and communication from Cal Berkeley. You came here in 1972. And after you arrived, you came to the conclusion that our community in Salt Lake needed some help, and you decided to stay. You've been here almost 50 years since then. So I guess to start off, maybe describe for us what you experienced when you moved here to Salt Lake and what convinced you to stay as long as you have. Well, when I first arrived in Utah, the first issue was a matter of housing. Uh, The university had arranged for me to rent a place to stay uh, I had a telephone installed and had paid a deposit on the place, but when I showed up, the landlord said, not here, and uh, would not allow me to move in. So I I stayed with some uh, fellow uh, communication professors uh, for a while until I finally uh, got a place to stay on campus in the international house. Dr. Borea Jarvis was uh, instrumental in helping me to secure a place after I was refused uh, the initial place. And uh, I've uh, learned from that that Utah was a bit behind in terms of (coughs) human rights and civil rights for all people here in the state of Utah. It's it's amazing to hear you tell that story. I mean, you know, yes, a lot has changed in in recent years, but we're still just talking about the 1970s. I know the civil rights movement was from the mid 50s to late 60s, and 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 you know the 70s were just kind of past those times. But still, to to hear about that uh, even in the 70s is is pretty amazing. You know, you moving here from California and and so hopeful of of your opportunities that were to be in front of you. What did that kind of do to you emotionally and, and mentally to, to move someplace and, and, and have that happen to you at, at, that, at that point in time? Well, Berkeley was a uh, place that was uh, open and uh, receptive to people who were of different uh, racial backgrounds. 
But uh, when I came here, I've, I felt like I was unwanted and that I was a spectacle to be gazed at. In fact, when I would go to eat at the restaurants, uh, people would look and make uh, different kind of remarks about uh, what I looked like and what I needed to do and so forth uh, to uh, to be here in Utah. So it was uh, it took me back, and it also uh, was hurtful to feel like uh, I was not a person of worth and I didn't have anything to contribute when I knew that I did. So uh, it was that kind of feeling. You know, it's amazing to hear you you tell those stories, Reverend Davis, about your early days here in this community. Again, we're just talking about the the 1970s and so forth, but you've done so much since you, you came to Salt Lake and decided to stay here in addition to working at the U, which you started in, in 1972 and just retired from that position really four years ago. But you also really got the, 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 the congregation grown tremendously at Calvary Baptist Church. You started there in 1974. You retired there this past December after 46 years. And, you know, since you really got things going there, there have been a lot more, uh, predominantly black churches, you know, thrive in this community that have taken off, but you were the one who really got the first one going and and did so much for so many back in those days in the 70s. As you said, the black community was really just fighting for uh, a voice and uh, and equality in this community. So if you can, you know, just tell us about some of the things you've done uh, in terms of fighting for equal rights for housing and health care and jobs and so forth for the black community and, and Salt Lake City since you've been here in the 70s. Well, I would just uh, start by reminding all of us that the African Americans have been in this community since the 1820s. James Beckworth and others were here fur trapping in the 1820s. Okay. And when the Mormon pioneers first came, there were African Americans who came with them. Uh, Hartley, Green Flake, and Oscar Crosby, for example. Uh, and then the Elijah Abel was uh, here in the 1850s, who uh, actually held a priesthood in the uh, largest uh, and predominant uh, church of the community, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Uh, and he was known to have helped to build the uh, temple and the tabernacle, uh, both of which downtown Salt Lake City. Uh, now, uh, one of which is being remodeled. And then uh, the African-American churches actually started in the eight, early 1890s with Trinity AME Church and Calvary Baptist. Uh, Calvary, which I was pastor of, and Trinity were kind of uh, sister churches, uh, they tell me that you could find the uh, people at one at one time, and at a different time you go to the others and you'd find the same uh, people there. They were largely African Americans. Mm-hmm. And in 1902, uh, there was a fundraiser held by Calvary that the uh, local newspapers called uh, a possum dinner. <laughs> it, was, it was a dinner to raise funds to help to pay for a uh, building that was being purchased on uh, 3rd uh, East and uh, 7th, 3rd South and 7th East. Uh, The congregation grew and uh, finally moved to 5th East and 7th South, which by the time I got here, uh, they they were there, but uh, still relatively small. I got involved in 1972 and became the pastor uh, in 1974, and the congregation began to grow uh, with my University of Utah connections and other efforts in the community, the congregation began to grow. We work with uh, Ed Firmage on the uh, uh, MX missile issue. Uh, we were able to get the fair housing bill passed in the state legislature. Uh, we were able to uh, make sure that people had decent and affordable housing, including one unit that we built and uh, 30 units that we built uh, on the corner of 5th East and 7th South. 
Uh, in addition to that, we got a park named for uh, the first college graduate of Utah State who was African American, whose name was Mignon Barker Richmond. And that park is still there. And finally, we got the street name uh, as the Martin Luther King Boulevard. Right. So, so we've done a number of things to ensure that uh, African Americans were considered a part of this community. In 2002, uh, prior to 2002, when we were looking forward to the uh, coming of the uh, Olympic Games, uh, the whole community decided that they needed to be more open and needed to recognize the uh, roles of people like Elijah Abel and others and African Americans. And so I was part of the team that helped to uh, welcome the world to Utah for the Olympic Games. So we've done uh, some significant things. And then finally, we built a building in 2001 on State Street, which is uh, is now big enough to accommodate all of the uh, members of the church and to have some room for growth. Well, Reverend Davis, people in your community at Calvary Baptist really talked about how you built an uncommon community. And it wasn't just the people in your church of Baptist faith that was Jews, Episcopalians, Presbyterians, Catholics, Latter-day Saints. And with that last group, you know, it's it's, it's interesting because the time you came here in the early 70s, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints barred black men and boys from holding the all-male priesthood. And in fact, black women and girls were, were barred from entering the face temples. So you know, that was a tough group for you to, to face, and, and I know there were some challenges early on, but yet, you know, you, you stayed so strong and, and so open, and, uh, and and you really wanted to, to work with that group, and you gave them a chance. And as the years uh, progressed, you, you really made some inroads working with them on various things, and, and it's been tremendous to see that happen. So my question to you is, you know, in the face of resistance and in the face of some of the things you experienced with the the LDS Church for you to 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 be so willing to work with them. You know how did that how did that come from with inside you to to make that process happen? Well, not only did we decide that it was important to put emotions aside, but also that we had to agree to disagree on theological uh, basis, and so we agreed to disagree on that issue, uh, while at the same time we push to ensure that uh, members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints did have the full rights and privileges as every other member did. And finally, in 1978, uh, there was a revelation handed down which said that now all eligible males can hold the priesthood, and that included people of African-American descent. Since that time, I've been working with uh, the leaders of uh, all of the different faith groups, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, the Episcopals, the Catholic, uh, the Southern Baptists, the Churches of God in Christ, the Methodists, to say to them, listen, all of us have something to contribute. All of us have uh, somebody, and all of us uh, have a role to play in terms of positive change. And I think that's one of the things that this current pandemic of uh, viral and racial issues is uh, reminding us that everybody has a role to play and something to contribute. And unless we invite that full participation, then none of us will be all that we can be. We can't reach our potential unless we help others to reach theirs. Well, you've done some tremendous work in this community. As I said, it's it's so hard to uh, to s- sort of look at the establishment and step up and be a voice and 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 work for change. We'll get back to more of this stuff. And as you kind of touched on the the current climate, I want to get into that with more a little bit more with you here in a little bit. But let's talk about your affiliation with the University of Utah and and specifically the athletics program, which is what this podcast is based around. So you started teaching at the the U in 1972, and then in 
2003, Urban Meyer arrived at Utah as the new football coach and brought John as the team chaplain. Tell me how Urban approached you about that role and, and why do you think it was important to have you in that position with this football program? Well, one of the things that uh, Urban Myers as coach for the uh, football team did was uh, he uh, believed that every player needed to be fully developed. And that is to have not only their academic, their economic, their political, their social, but also their spiritual side taken care of. So he called me shortly after he arrived in town asked me if I'd be willing to work with him on the spiritual piece and help him to do that. And so I became uh, the uh, chaplain and worked with him for uh, until he left. Uh, then uh, since that time, I've been working with the present coach, Coach Whittingham, uh, to do the same thing, to provide the players with uh, an awareness of their need not just to be football players physically, to be students academically, to be economically sufficient, politically aware, but also to be spiritually tuned in. And uh, if they can't go to a local church or uh, facility for worship, as none of us can nowadays, uh, then they could uh, do it as uh, part of the team. And so... I've been working with him to ensure that that happens. You know, it's interesting. When you moved to Salt Lake City, the African-American community was around 10,000. It's now nearly 50,000 in the state of Utah. So you grew Calvary Baptist Church. And as I mentioned, there are dozens of other predominantly black, black churches now in the community. But, you know, still for black college students who move here from other parts of the country, it can still be a, a challenging transition to to move here and really can be for all college students. But, uh you, you know, you talked about your affiliation with the football program. Tell us how you've maybe been able to help some of our UD athletes navigate that transition, and can you share some stories about success in that process? Well, one of the things that I've done both with Calvary Baptist Church and with the football program is insisted that each person recognizes the right of every other person, regardless or what they look like, where they came from, their heritage, their background, their skin color, all of those things. And so by doing that, uh, the team has uh, fared well. So has the Calvary Baptist Church. So the Calvary Church is now about 70% African American, but the other 30% would be people of all other sorts and backgrounds. And so I think that's the important piece that's helped the congregation to grow as well as help my participation at the university is uh, not distinguishing between persons because of the way they look or their heritage or their background, but rather uh, patting everybody on the back and telling them that they all are somebody. Well, that's certainly important uh, to, to have that support and and have that for our athletics programs as a resource. I know you've been talking to um, as basketball coach Larry Kristoviak about doing some things down the road. Uh, you, you've been so invaluable to the, our entire community, not just Utah Athletics, obviously, and, and the UVU campus, but really all of Salt Lake City. And when the, the situation arose with George Floyd being killed by police officers in Minneapolis back in late May, our, our, our athletics director, Mark Harlan, had you on a Zoom call with our entire staff a, a few weeks ago, really a week after that happened. And and with your background as a civil rights activist, as a pillar of our community who has been uh, you know, fighting for change and equality and, and social justice and racial uh, you know, balance and so forth, I thought your message was so poignant as we work through these times of unrest with the coronavirus pandemic that's really impacted the black community tremendously. And you really amplified the fight for, as I said, racial and social equality. So, you know, as you've watched the coverage of the death of George Floyd in Minneapolis, and now recently the death of Rashard Brooks in Atlanta and the protests that have gone on and have continued for weeks and weeks across the country and really around the world, what thoughts have gone through your mind as we've watched this unfold? Well, the first thought that goes to my mind and continues to go through day in and day out is that there are some of us, me included, who've lived with these sorts of acts and, and 
misacts, if you if you will, mm-hmm. uh, misbehavior that has been occurring recently all of our time. We now, because of social media and because of the uh, ability to record uh, uh, events as they happen, uh, others are now becoming aware of that. And that's very similar to what Dr. King's marches was about. His marches were about how do I bring the attention of the whole world to this particular uh, misdeed or uh, bad act that is happening and thus cause them to want to change. So that's the first thought is that uh, we need to uh, continue to remind people that these are events that have been going on long before now, but now they are becoming more and more uh, public. The second thing uh, that comes to mind is that as I watch the events around the uh, George, uh, his uh, life and his death, uh, I'm reminded that uh, some of us are just careless about the life of people who are different than us and that we need to learn that difference does not mean more or less than. It simply uh, means difference. In fact, my dad used to say that variety is the spice of life. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really what restaurants like Chukarama and other places like that that (laughs) give you a a variety of foods that you can choose from. So variety is the spice of life. It sure is. So I think we can help one another uh, by uh, realizing that. And then thirdly, and perhaps most importantly, if we're going to change things for the better, all of us have to be participants in that. Every time I go to the hospital, they tack on to my bill uh, an extra uh, percentage for the people who don't have medical insurance. Uh, Every time I uh, deal with housing and the utilities. I pay a little bit more for people who can't pay their bills. Mm -hmm. So the same is true with uh, the racial issue. If we don't solve that issue and bring everybody along to full citizenship, all of us are going to pay a price for that. Yeah, we sure are. You know, one of the quotes you gave our staff that day a few weeks back in early June was, violence is immoral because it thrives on hatred, not love. Right. And at that point, right. you know, the, the, the protests were involved uh, with a lot of violence and, and some negativity snuck into those. And as we've heard since then, there were some people who really weren't close to the cause that, that infiltrated those protests and they started out as peaceful and turned out not to be so. But really, uh, you know, more recently, they have been more peaceful. The National Guard units that were called upon have, have been allowed to go away. And, and I think really the, the the essence of what those protests were intended to be is what they've become. But you, you really kind of made a great point is, listen, uh, you know, change, yes, we need it to happen, but we need to do it the right way. It needs to be about about love and not hatred. And and that's been a pretty consistent message of yours. Just Just talk about why you think that's so important, and I know there's some obvious reasons, and really kind of how you you've er, er, you know, developed that that message so strongly over the years. Well, I, I'm convinced, as was Dr. King, that violence is the language, and riots are the is the language of the unheard, mm-hmm. and that we need to hear people who are complaining that their needs are not being met, that they are not being adequately represented that they are uh, suffering in in major ways. And so the language of violence and the rioting is that of those who have not been hurt. And that's why it's important for us to remember that violence is not the best tool for solving problems. Nonviolent, civil disobedience uh, works every day. Uh, the students and the leaders of the initial march on Saturday after George was killed in Utah uh, started out uh, nonviolently. Mm-hmm. And then later on, uh, it was converted, and the people that changed it did not appear to be the same people who had started out nonviolently. 
So I think uh, we need to give credit to those who have uh, approached the, the uh, task the right way and uh, then take credit away from those who've uh, converted it or infiltrated uh, the movement and tried to make it uh, something that it's not. Visiting with Reverend France Davis, who recently retired from Calvary Baptist Church, who also four years ago retired from his post as an adjunct professor with the University of Utah in communications and ethnic studies. And, uh, you know, Reverend Davis, you talked about uh, your affiliation with Dr. Martin Luther King back in the in the late 60s. You know, whenever we in our, in our world and in, in our country have been faced with change. A lot of times the, the path to the future is, is, is found by looking back at your past and, and finding things and seeing things that happened before. And, and you can see some things as they played out and maybe get some ideas of how to continue in the future. And to have someone like yourself who marched with, with Dr. King back in the late sixties during the, the civil rights movement. Uh, in fact, you were involved in the marches from Selma to Montgomery, Alabama in 1965 that uh, was uh, chronicled in the movie recently. You know, looking back at, at that time with Dr. Martin Luther, Luther King, what was that experience like for you? And what did you learn from that experience that you've taken with you uh, down the road? Well, that 1965 march from Selma to Montgomery was a real lesson in how to – uh, those who have little or no vested interests can be a real help to those who do have vested interests. Mm -hmm. Those who live in the community and uh, can't do anything about their circumstance need a voice to speak on. They need to a voice, and they sometimes need somebody who will speak on their behalf. And that's what we learned from that march is that we were there students and uh, Dr. King and others to uh, speak on behalf of the people who lived in uh, Selma, Alabama, who could not uh, register, couldn't vote, uh, didn't have the uh, the opportunity to be uh, part of the elected representative society. And so we learned that. The second thing we learned is that fighting back uh, really uh, didn't solve the problem either. Uh, we were surrounded by Klansmen and uh, police officers who did not have our interests <clears throat> in uh, mind. Uh, but uh, to fight them would, be, would have been a losing battle. We, we were not equipped uh, mentally nor physically to uh, take on the uh, people who were there that were fighting against us. And so we learn early to how to do that. And then thirdly, we learn how to protect ourselves uh, so that uh, when uh, we were put upon, uh, we uh, would ball ourselves up in a way that we couldn't be uh, permanently hurt or uh, hurt in, in a serious manner in most cases. Mm-hmm. Pretty amazing for you to not just live through those times, but be so actively involved, as you mentioned, uh, marching with Dr. Martin Luther King and, and and being so active in that. And you've continued, uh, you know, your your push for equality since uh, since those those days. Um, you know, the question a lot of people have had, and you addressed this with our staff a few weeks ago, is, you know, I'm seeing things happening, and I, I want to help us change and change in a positive direction. And people have some ideas, but don't know where to start, or they don't have ideas, and and they want to help, but don't know how. So, for people out there listening who who want to have an active role in this community for helping us become better and and across the country, what what ideas, what advice do you have for them on how to go about that process? Well, the first uh, idea that I would give to those who don't know what to do is that you need to start by knowing who you are yourself mm -hmm. and being convinced that you are who you are, that you have something to contribute. And then the second, but perhaps the most important, is to then go when opportunity comes, register and go to the polls and vote so that our representative government will be truly a representative government, that those who are in office will be there and that they will have our interests 
uh, at heart when they uh, vote or take action. The third thing is uh, those who have privilege and power ought to use that privilege and power for those who don't have privilege and don't have power. The under the underrepresented and the underserved uh, need others. When I when I show up at a at a uh, gathering, uh, they say, "Oh, there he is," and they've uh, quickly identified me as a rabble rouser or as a pro- person who's always bringing the negative. But what would happen if uh, I showed up and uh, you were there and the president of the colleges was there and the police chief was there and the uh, mayors were there? It would be a different reaction. Right. And so those who have power and privilege ought to use that to help others who don't have. Uh, fourthly, uh, we uh, got to change the laws, the policies, and the practices so that uh, in uh, George Floyd's case, for example, it wouldn't be legal to do what the officer did by putting his uh, foot on his neck and holding him there for more than eight minutes. Mm-hmm. That, but but if we don't change the laws, change the policies, change the practices, uh, we uh, will never get that done. Now, of course, that means involving not only the local officials, but also the state officials and the federal officials to make some of those changes. And that's where voting and letter writing telephone calling and that sort of thing can can make a difference. And then the last thing that I would suggest is that all of us need to learn to treat uh, each person as a full person. Uh, The Constitution of the United States of America used to define for representation purposes some people as full people, some as no people, and some as three fifths of a person. Well, we've got to get beyond that and decide that everybody who is a human being uh, is a full person and has rights that uh, all of us need to regard and respect. In the Dred Scott decision, the Supreme Court concluded that there were no rights, for example, that uh, African Americans, it used the word Negro back in those days, that African Americans had that whites were bound to respect. Well, that's that's just not right. Yeah. So the uh, the rights of one person and the uh, the personality that one person is ought to be as highly regarded as that of any other person. You make some wonderful points. Um, you know, you look at what's happening around our country and, and locally right now, Reverend Davis. I mean, uh, the U.S. Congress is is talking about changes, some legislation that's been proposed. You're looking at things on the local level with the elections coming up. I mean, there, there are ways to make change on a local level. It, it doesn't have to be nationally right away to, to really impact what's going on. And the other thing is, you know, as you watch the protests uh, on live television and you see photos, it, it's not just black people involved, it's white people, it's people of all ages that are involved in this. And it seems like for whatever reason, you know, what happened with George Floyd really was a spark uh, that, that caused some things to be uh, sure. different than we've seen in other cases. There's been way too many instances where a black man has died at the hands of police in, in recent years, but this one, for whatever reason, uh, felt different for so many people, and, and we've seen the results of that. But you know, as you watch the, the different people and, and various races and ages get involved in, in these protests and calling for change, and you see legislation actually being drawn up and things being talked about at the local levels of you know police reform and so forth, uh, Reverend Davis, are you are you optimistic that with you know what's going on and, and sort of the momentum? the momentum that's happening right now. Are you optimistic that we really have a chance to change the course uh, of things well, with what's going on right now? That, I think, is the real beauty of what's happening now. Uh, while I'm opposed to the violence and the burning and the looting and all of that, I think the fact that people are coming together, regardless of who they are, 
what they look like, what their background is, and their orientations and all of that. They're coming together and deciding, hey, whatever affects that group also is going to affect us, and we'd better do something about that. Secondly, the beauty of this is that now, even at the congressional level, uh, people are deciding, representatives are deciding, I best represent all of my constituents, not just those who voted for me. Yeah. And I think that's the optimism. Now, I don't expect that it'll happen within my own lifetime because I've been here for, uh, 70 plus years and it hadn't happened. And I thought that it would have happened when, uh, Martin Luther King was here. I thought for sure it would have happened when Mr. Obama was elected president of the United States of America. Uh, but it hadn't happened. So I don't know that it'll happen within my lifetime, but I believe that we will get, as Dr. King would say, we'll get there. Uh, as a people, that there'll come a day when uh, we'll put aside these uh, racist attitudes that we have and start quit bullying one another and move forward. You know, you you make a, a great point that kind of leads me to my next question. You know, when you talked to our athletic staff a while ago, you know, people were asking, what what can Utah Athletics do? What can the university do to, to help this process? And and you said, you know, really, we need to get our student athletes in the community more and, and really get them involved and not isolate them on campus and really get them out. And, and really kind of what your point, I think, was is, you know, we have people who just don't know each other. And this unfamiliarity, uh, it causes some of our issues where if we just mix a little bit more and, and, and make an effort to get along and to support each other, that can help us really you know, make some change. And, and we're seeing that with the, the mixes of the various races and, and age groups and the protests and so forth. You know, maybe talk about that a little bit more, uh, just about the importance of, of people giving each other a chance and opening ourselves up to uh, getting to know different people and, and different ideas as part of this, this uh, process of change. If we ever seriously take uh, to heart this need for positive change, then we'll start by informing ourselves about people who are different than us. Mm -hmm. And once we do that, we will discover that their uh, kitchen stove, their washing machine, uh, their doors open the same way that ours do, and that all of us are in the boat together. we got to work together in order to bring about change. Uh, I go fishing uh, from time to time, and one day I was fishing down at one of the local lakes and uh, saw, uh, I was on the bank, but saw near the bank a little boat with a father and a son in it. And the son stood up and began to point toward his uh, father's feet and laugh. And his dad told him to stop that laughing now, you're going to scare the fish. And he continued <laughs> to stand continued to laugh. His dad says, okay, if you keep, if you keep laughing and pointing, uh, then we're going to roll in our reels, our lines, and be done for the day. The kid continued to do it. And finally, uh, the father said, okay, let's uh, roll in our lines and let's go. And then he said to the son, oh, by the way, what are you laughing at? And the son told him, your end of the boat is leaking as if the end of his, the father's end of the boat was going to go down, but his was not. Mm -hmm. Well, the same is true with all of us. Uh, we've got to work together, come together, athletes, uh, community people, uh, students, uh, professors, Ivory Hill people, and those that are in the larger community. we got to work together for the good of all. And only when we work together for the good of all will we be able to achieve the ultimate end of freedom, justice, and equality for everybody. Some great words there, Reverend Davis. Before I let you go, uh, you know, you've been in, in this community for almost 50 years, coming here in the early 70s. And we've talked about during this podcast how, you know, Salt Lake City and the state of Utah has changed so much with the growth of the black community and and uh, more and more congregations like you got going at, at Calvary Baptist Church. 
Uh, you've been here for a long time. You've done a lot. You, you've been uh, a very patient man, a strong man. As you look back at your time in, in this community, what are some things that have maybe warmed your heart the most uh, you know, in terms of your inter- interaction with people, the progress you've made, the hope you've, you've seen and experienced, and, and now this current climate of the, the things, we, things we've seen in downtown Salt Lake in the recent month? What, what's warmed your heart the most during your time here? Well, I would say, first of all, that the University of Utah, its athletic programs as well as its academic programs have been a pleasant place to be, that they have offered an opportunity for uh, growth and development, and that through them, uh, we've been able to achieve a lot of things that otherwise I don't think we would have been able to do. So I think uh, places like the University, Salt Lake Community College, those uh, academic institutions have uh, been a, uh, a heartwarming to watch them as they do research and then base their uh, actions on uh, uh, research, that's on, on evidence. A uh, second thing has been that uh, the... Uh, LD, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints has uh, been making uh, some significant changes. Uh, they changed the uh, curse of uh, blacks so that they are no longer cursed. They've uh, joined with the NAACP a couple of years ago to do some things. Mm-hmm. Uh, the current president has been open to uh, me talking to him. Uh, uh, I, I would never have presumed that that was possible years ago. So, uh, but now that's possible. And then uh, perhaps the greatest thing that has warmed my heart is to see so many people who are not the affected joining the movement for positive change in these recent days both in terms of the viral pandemic and in terms of the racial pandemic. And if we can continue to have people of all sorts, uh, wherever they sit, uh, decide that they need to do something, then I think we'll be able to make the change. Reverend Davis, tremendous words. You know, in times like this where it's unsettled and, and so many are dealing with so much, it's so important to have people like yourselves who've been through uh, as much as you have been and to have a, a wise voice, a steady voice, and really a voice of hope to help us get through this and to, to give us some direction through these tough times. And Reverend Davis, I, I know you've retired from uh, uh, your duties as the pastor, but you are far from permanently retired and you're as busy as ever. So I appreciate your time and, and thank you for dropping by. Well, it's my pleasure, and I would uh, echo the words of my son who practices medicine here. He says it's time to not just talk anymore, but now to act. Yep. So let's do something. A great way to end it. Uh, Reverend Davis, thank you so much. Thank you. My pleasure. All right. That's Reverend France Davis, Emeritus Adjunct Professor at the U and also Emeritus Pastor of Calvary Baptist Church. Back to wrap things up on Utes Insider, presented by Pepsi in just a moment. For more on Utah athletics, including up-to-date schedules and ticket information, log on to utahutes.com. Now back to more of Utes Insider, presented by Pepsi. And thank you once again to Reverend France Davis for joining our show. I thought it would be just... uh, such a good person to bring on during these times of concerns over not just the economy and our, our health crisis, but really since the death of George Floyd on May 25th in Minneapolis, I think we've all been struggling with this idea of uh, coming to terms with anger, frustration, and this desire to help us move forward in the fight for social and, and racial equality in this country. And, you know, it's not just a problem facing African-Americans or minorities. It's really an American injustice that we all must own and address head on if we're going to move forward as a country. And a quote we've seen a lot during the past three to four weeks is one made by Abraham Lincoln well before he became president 162 years ago, almost on June 16th, 1858. And he said, a house divided against itself cannot stand. And those words still reign true today. And Reverend Davis uh, dropping by to give some thoughts on how this house can maybe not be quite so divided. And he had some great ideas about, hey, you know, don't just think about 
doing something, actually do it. Don't be a spectator. Kind of figure out who you are, what you stand for, and find ways to get involved to make a difference. And I thought his perspective and his ideas were, were tremendous. And I thank him again for coming by the show. Reverend France Davis, the former uh, adjunct professor for communications and ethnic studies at the U of U and also the uh, Pastor Emeritus of Calvary Baptist Church here in the Salt Lake Valley. Well, that will do it for our shows for the month of June. We'll turn our attention to July and some football talk. I'm efforting some shows with some of the all-time greats in Utah football history. That will come your way in July. If you have ideas for some show guests or some thoughts on the show, drop me a line. Email me at M-L-A-G-E-S at Huntsman.Utah.edu. That will do it for this edition of Utes Insider presented by Pepsi. I'm Mike Ligeschultz. Until next time, so long, everybody. This has been Utes Insider presented by Pepsi. To hear more episodes of this show and other Utah athletics podcasts, search for them on iTunes, Spotify, and YouTube.